Hey guys, how's it going? Michael Troy here. We are back for week number three discussing the X-Men 97 show. It should be a very exciting episode this week because uh, I was totally shook by this episode, as I'm sure Philip was. Philip Urso is back with me to discuss the exciting episode after last week, which which wasn't a horrible episode, but it felt a little bit like a filler episode. I feel like they more than made up for it with this week ep- week's episode. Would you not agree? Would you like to start your reaction? <laughs> well, I the internet almost spoiled me uh, yesterday because uh, there was just so many OMGs posted on Facebook. And I tried to stay away and off social media as long as I could until I got home from work. Um, my uh, my nephew Michael had texted me first thing in the morning. I'm almost I'm I'm not I wouldn't be surprised if he's one of those people who stays up until 3 a.m. to watch it because he works nights yeah. and does not get up as early in the morning. Um and then my other nephew Sean, after I got off work, was like, oh dear God. And I was like, so I had watched it when I got home. And I thought this was gonna be the filler up between life death one and life death two. And now I find even though I've been dying for life death, oh little pun intended there. Um <laughs> because it's all about storm and forge you know my fave ex couple ever i'm like now i'm gonna find next week is gonna be filler until we get resolution for this <laughs> i know it's funny you should say that because yeah i feel kind of the same way because and not knowing what this episode was about we could have cared less we were so excited waiting for the life death part two and now they just like hit us with this whammy and now we're like left with this it was so emotional like it's so funny because yeah the good thing you stayed away from the internet because it was blowing up all over the place like every one of my friends was posting like oh my god this latest episode of x-men you know and i agree like it was totally like wow they really have pulled out all the stops um it's just kind of crazy i mean uh what all happened it's like so we start out on genosha and we've got it was fun to see like did you notice the easter eggs the like grant morrison characters in the beginning i did i think and then i noticed like um i'm not going to mention my kill list which i have made up for this chat for people (laughs) either who look dead or are dead um (laughs) like exodus pixie boom boom i noticed all of them and i'm mentioning them because i didn't see their dead bodies later uh-huh. <laughs> now, other people who, um, so let me know when you want my kill list. <laughs> so we, we start out with Trish Tilby. I thought that was awesome. Has she that made an cool. appearance in the series before? Is this her debut? To your I, recollection? or I don't recall seeing her in the animated series, you know. Um, and that's fine because this was a great intro for her because, you know, the animated series was definitely geared more towards kids I mean, and adults who read the comics actively, where Mm -hmm. this is just aimed at everyone. Yeah. You would not have gotten away in the 90s with the gore or the intensity or the the death that that this did. And that's kind of cool because they are taking it to the next level. Um, Right down to the 90s techno music when they were at the gala. (laughs) (laughs) There, oh my God, I died when Happy Nation by Ace of Base started playing. Like, I lost my mind. I like, it, it felt ridiculous yet horribly appropriate at the same time. I was just like, you know, they must have been laughing their asses off in production, like throwing that little gem in there. <laughs> and, you know, I was happy to see Madeline Pryor again so soon. Yeah, um, I was surprised to see that. And, uh, and Cable's back. I mean, Cable's so much back. happened this episode. <laughs> But that's an interesting thing, though, because I'm just wondering if this was an Easter egg of them establishing, you know, because we still don't know when the swap happened, even though most of us think it happened in season four of the original series when Scott and Gene really got married and Gene was abducted by Sinister and Apocalypse. Right. Um, Someone speculated that it happened during their honeymoon. And I was just like, wow, that's so rude. Yeah. Their first honeymoon was in season two. But there is no way they would have proceeded with all of season two and season three when she's Phoenix with and retconning it to that Madeline was Phoenix. Like I said, fans would lose their everything if Gene was not the Phoenix. But um, in season two, when Cable shows up for the second time, he appears in season one. Rogue uh, is the one who has the most interaction. And I think Gene and Cyclops see him on Muir Isle. Um, 
And then season two, he comes back for a two-parter that involves Bishop, of course. And uh, Jean scans his mind. And you see little images of like her and Scott in the background. And I think an X logo, of course, you know, product placement. Um, and then like strands of the virus, I think that she, they were trying to prevent from happening in this time period. And she says to Cyclops, he's more important to the future, our future, than you could ever imagine. So I'm like, okay, why is she not owning up to what she just saw? So that never comes up again. So when Madeline knew who he was and said, oh my God, you know, blah, 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 blah. That leads me to believe that, well, definitely Madeline was not the season two gene because season two gene should know who Cable is. Right. I mean, I know there's yeah. been some flops, but that's very Psylocke quanon esque where, you know, they never, you know, it was just like, okay, well, she's this and she's that. And there's half of that and half of this. And let's just mix it up, stir and divide by two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was nice to see um, Nightcrawler, of course. Um, it's kind of funny because, like, when when I read the X Men, I don't read his voice like in a German accent. So I know he's supposed to be German, but I've never heard his voice in a German accent in my mind. So it's always so funny to see him like use it appropriately, of course. But I don't know. You know, we all have our different voices for our characters in our minds. So he is in two episodes of the first series. Um, the first one takes place in a monastery, I think near the Swiss Alps or, you know, because the X-Men, three of the X-Men are in France. Rogue and Gambit trying to have a little getaway. And of course, Wolverine, because Wolverine had to be in almost every episode. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, I think Wolverine misses like four episodes out of 76 of the he original. Hasn't, he hasn't been really um, overused that much or if no, used at all so far. There, I, I'm meeting him on Saturday, which that'll be cool. Um, You're meeting Wolverine. Hal Dodd, the voice of Wolverine <laughs> in the original series. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought, you know, they're definitely spreading it out nicely this season. Um, but when um, they were talking about, uh, God, what was, I was like, where was I going with that? Um, where? I just had a total brain freeze, you know. I'm thinking. I know, no, I feel you. I'm like, there's so many like things push. I want to talk about, and like, I don't even know where to start, or like, it's flailing around in my mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I saw that, I was just like, oh, me and Michael are going to have a lot to discuss. So, I'll go straight into what I was prepared for: my kill list. Yes, please give us your kill list. So, based on what I saw, and please tell me if um, you saw or remember, you know, I don't know how many times you've watched it, but I watched the episode twice yesterday. Uh, I haven't had time to watch it again. I will watch it again because I feel um, like it was fully loaded, like with exactly. so many. Um, and when we rescheduled, I was like, you know, okay, well, let me get another one. Let me get another viewing in just to make my kill list. And uh, <laughs> so, Banshee and Marrow, after the big explosion at the gala, Yes, um, I saw Mira. He got disintegrated by Master Mold when he was flying away. Um, and then, you know, of course, there was Moira. I saw Moira, you know, but they didn't establish, are they dead, are they injured? But they were implying they were all dead, the people who were on the, except for Nightcrawler, where they went out of their way to say Nightcrawler was still breathing. Mm -hmm. Or still, but on um, the, there was Moira, Callisto. Callisto's definitely dead because we saw her pupils change or her irises mm -hmm. or do that thing. Um, Dazzler, sorry. You know, they can kill this version of yeah. Dazzler for, uh, for all I care. <laughs> Sebastian Shaw, um, Squid Boy, um, Gambit. <laughs> I know, oh my god. And, like, and I, Magneto and four of the, the Morlocks, which were Leech, Erg, Ape, and Tommy. Yeah. Oh, now, I know, how exciting was it to see Tommy? Have we seen Tommy in, um... She has a an Easter egg cameo in the very first Morlocks episode of season one when Storm uh, wins wi uh, leadership from Callisto. She is one of the most visually interesting yet sort of perplexing characters. Like her look is so hard for me to wrap my mind around. I all I see is like John Romita version, G Junior's version, and um, you know uh, the Mutant Massacre. I think isn't that where she made her first yeah, appearance in the comics? Her first and only appearance, right? Does she is she resurrected later on? I don't know. It's hard to keep track. I know. I was looking at like lists of X Men titles, uh, you know, that I've never read in between my huge gap of like X Men. 
And um, so many things have happened that I am completely unaware of. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I'm like, after, like I said, after the late 90s, I'm like, it was just, okay, I read that, but I didn't read that. And I kind of skimmed this, but not that. So there's just so much that yeah. in the last two decades or so, I'm not, I, I hear about it or read on the X-Men pages of, oh my God, can you believe what happened at the Hellfire Gala, blah, 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 blah. You know, like um, apparently in this, you know, at some point in time, Kurt and Rachel are a couple, which I think is creepy. Oh my God. Um, With it's just it's like, like her, uh, it's like her uncle. Yeah. It's like Melrose Place. I guess everyone has to wind up with everybody at yeah. some point. Yeah, I've never, cool. I've never liked, I've never, you said that, you know, it's like, I've never really liked Aurora and um, uh, Wolverine as a couple. I've never, like, they've hinted at Nightcrawler and Aurora as a couple in the past, or do they full on become a couple? I'm just like, don't, you know, don't do that. Like, I don't know. Like, it's not interesting enough for a temporary story in my mind. Do you know what I mean? And this, this might be me getting like, I don't know, some slings or arrows, but I never like shipped Kitty with Ileana or Rachel. And a lot of people are like, why? And I'm like, because Ileana was like her little sister and her best friend. And she was so pro Peter and Kitty as a couple. She was like their biggest supporter in the beginning. You know, so one, it would be like Ileana's breaking the sibling rule. And two, Kitty was like her big sister. And with the Rachel thing, that was apparently where it was going to go in Excalibur. Um, wait, point, wait, wait, wait. So Ileana and Kitty were supposed to be a couple? It, it was, there was talk about there was a plan at some point, but in Excalibur, then they were going to replace that with Kitty and Rachel. But remember, in Days of Future Past, adult Kitty was like Rachel's second mom. I feel like that's, that's that like shows like uh, uh, someone, like whoever had that idea, like doesn't understand what being gay is all about. Because it's like you would never like have a relationship with your best friend slash sister you know what i mean like it i just don't see it morphing into or your that. Third mother or you know <laughs> well, yeah. when they when they dropped hints of kitty and karma in the mechanics miniseries i was totally down with that that would have been freaking awful <laughs> that would have been okay i kind of like i don't know i maybe call me crazy but i kind of like i like kitty and colossus together but i mean i, I realized do after she became legal <laughs> yeah yeah of course of course i know i know you know it's like let's not worry about which sex these people uh which gender these people wind up dating let's get them of legal age first okay right. absolutely and speaking <laughs> which of which it's a perfect segue <laughs> boy you laid it out completely like it almost that like the way they told the magneto uh rogue story was pretty mm -hmm. much basically how you laid it out. Like, was it last week or the week before? Like, she basically yeah. gets she gets trafficked. I mean, she gets dropped off to um, be. Uh, I don't know what he's supposed to do. I mean, I don't think he was supposed to be the. I guess the anti Xavier or the Xavier equivalent, but just you know because Mystique <laughs> wasn't going to go to Xavier, and um, they did. I mean, it was really good use of continuity. That form that you saw Mystique in is the form she was in in season one. Because when Mystique was introduced in the Cure slash Apocalypse episodes, they act like her and Rogue don't know each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know where they were going with it, if they were just like adjusting the storyline as season one went, because I don't know how long season one was in production. It was 1991 when they started, you know, getting the green light on X-Men and it filmed it, it, it aired in 92 to 93. But um, so when Rogue doesn't recognize Mystique, we're like, oh, so they're retconning it because, you know, they kind of did that years later in the movies. Um, and then when they did the Days of Future Past storyline, Rogue is about to capture Mystique for trying to do the presidential assassination thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mystique says, you're not going to stop me. You're going to help me escape. And Rogue's like, now, why would I want to do that? And probably, sorry if my Southern accent, this just is not up to par right now. And Mystique says, because once I looked like this and she shapes it into that woman you saw with Rogue, mm -hmm. the blue haired, and that's who, and then they establish it later that, you know, Mystique in that form, for some reason, she never goes blue in front of Rogue. But I'm like, you're training her to be a mutant assassin. Why can't you be in your real form? And then you realize that Rogue was a member of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, but Xavier altered her memories because he was trying to wipe out Carol's influence and he was trying to get rid of trauma in her past while she was healing from that. So it was a Rogue's Tale. You definitely want to watch that at some point. <laughs> or do I? 
I'm just kidding. Or do you? But like I said, we're going to, you know, I'm going to get you to watch a season at a time and then we'll do one podcast per season. That is I was my goal. Say, goal this of is, I feel like what's going to happen is after we finish this season of X-Men 97, like I'm going to be like left so dry that I'm going to have to be forced to like binge watch the entire series before season two starts. Oh, now I remember what I forgot earlier. I was talking about Nightcrawler's introduction. It was like a monastery being attacked. I think one of the monks betrays him because he's a mutant freak and the X-Men help him. Then he shows up again later on where they do the Mystique bloodline storyline from X-Men Unlimited number four, where you realize that he's Mystique's son um, and Rogue's adopted brother by association. Which I really like the dynamic of Rogue being, um, you know, Mystique's adopted daughter. I wonder how that all came about. You know what I mean? Like, how, like, did they, they must have said like who Rogue's real parents were at some point and how Mystique got a hold of her. Have they never said that to your knowledge? They probably have because she has a full name. It's like Anna Marie DeCanto or something like that. I know. It's so funny. Like for, you know, it's like, I'm kind of of this school of thought. And this is a good question for you. Like it, like when they revealed Wolverine's origin and that horrible origin limited series with the James Howlett and stuff, I thought, wow, way to destroy a character. Like, one of his best, most compelling um, attributes as a character is having, like, this mysterious mysterious origin, right? And you build up the mystery so much that it has to be, like, so amazing. And the way they did it, oh, my God, that was awful. (laughs) Sorry, I just had to throw that in there. Of making him older than Xavier, you know? You don't like the idea of that? I don't like that idea. You know, you want Professor X to be the older, more mature, blah, 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 blah. I mean, you know, yeah, they could make say that he ages slower and this and that, but I just like Professor X being like, you know, the mentor right. or whatever and the, you know. I'm with you on that, except for the fact that I kind of do like, you know, like uh, him being, you know, hanging out with Cap like yeah. decades ago and That's stuff. Right. I don't know. Except that kind of is like, you know, well, so you hung out in the 40s and you seem like you were allies, but then like, But that had to be some sort of retcon because in Secret Wars, they had no love for each other in the comics. They, you know, Wolverine freaking hated Captain America. And he acted like they had no backstory because he was saying how Cap only worried about rights, human rights. If Oh, yeah. But what about mutant rights? Because and really, it's kind of a true story. You didn't see the Fantastic Four or the Avengers stick up for the X-Men in the pages of comics back in the 80s for the longest time you didn't see them marching in any picket lines for mutants you didn't say them getting on the line saying well why are mutants being hated but not all enhanced humans you know we have superpowers you mutants are just like us i mean it was just something that was completely ignored for years in the comics it's funny because that that kind of occurred to me like uh, i feel like as a young reader i was like why is it why why were the mutants persecuted just because they were born that way and the Fantastic Four weren't necessarily persecuted because they gained their powers, but they're arguably just as much, if not a bigger threat, than a mutant, the mutant menace, you know what I mean? But Yeah, so it was kind of annoying that, you know, the other, I mean, I know maybe they were just trying to separate comics and say, well, the mutant struggle is the X-Men's issue, and we don't want to introduce that into Fantastic Four because they're off to fight intergalactic menaces, blah, 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 you know. You know, and the the Avengers are like Marvel's Justice League, blah, 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 you know. Yeah, the it's X- funny. For the Teen Titans. Yeah, because I, I, I feel like that feeling was very, like, prevalent, like that they were outcasts and that the Avengers and the FF kind of knew it and were kind of okay with it. You know what I mean? It was just like the status quo. They just, they did nothing. It was, I was, and that, as a kid, I mean, you know, it was probably like when I read Secret Wars, I had to be about 12 or 13. And I was like, you know before there was oversaturation of Wolverine. And I'm like, he just put Cap in his place. And that man's right. You know, he was. <laughs> what What did Captain America do for mutant rights in the 80s or the 70s? <laughs> that is an excellent question. I guess nothing. Nobody did anything for mutant rights, really. But see, that's, I think that's kind of why, uh, like, one of the kind of great things about Magneto in a way is that he knows that it's never, they're never going to be accepted. You know what I mean? He just kind of knows that or whatever. He isn't yeah. like always trying to like, you know, build the bridge between humans and mutants the way that uh, Xavier did. I know, but this is where I'm like, you know, every, there's always those Magneto was right. And, you know, I'm not going to say Magneto didn't have, what is it, motivation? But 
I just, even though I know it's a very fairy tale mentality, and, you know, if we can't strive for Xavier's vision in real life, where are we as people? Because he just wants everyone to be equal. Everyone. Right. You know, it's about coexistence. It's about, you know, n- hatred of all kinds being eradicated, not, you know, anybody getting special treatment or preferential treatment. It's just about everybody being unified. And, you know, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful dream. And, you know, a lot of people thought, oh, he's a hypocrite. And yeah, there are a lot of retcons over time of what he's done, what Magneto's done. There's been a lot of flip-flopping. But I just think, you know, like I said, get off my soapbox soon. As as a society and, you know, Xavier's vision to me is the more inspiring one. Well, you know, it's funny because you said, like, the, the way you're talking about kind of reminds me of how, like, what a what a huge issue and how everyone was like enough is enough and how we were going to end bullying years ago but bullying is still alive and well you know what i mean certain things i don't know it's like i feel like it's a fallacy of humanity or something like Mm -hmm. it's hard to get rid of certain things you know what i mean correct you know and you know there's and there should be consequences for actions you know especially if if you're malicious you know Mm -hmm. you should have consequences for your actions so what else did we get in this episode? Oh, we... gosh. Um, well, there's Jean kissing Wolverine and then going off on Scott for having a psychic <laughs> date with Madeline. <laughs> you know, I feel... And Stop it. <laughs> I know, but I feel like, you know, good for her. Like, I'm sorry, but she's just, she just puts up with a lot of... You know, she's freaking Phoenix, and she puts up with a lot of crap from Scott. Like, he's such a... Like, why? Like, I don't get it. What's the appeal? And the other thing I found was weird is how do you look in Cable's eyes and see brown eyes and know it's Scott? Like, does Scott have brown eyes behind those ruby in reds? Comics, he, did. he did have brown eyes in the comics. <clears throat> yeah, I think I feel like, yeah, because I guess maybe because she used to be able to hold back his optic glass with her telekinesis. So she would be able, she's probably one of the few people who's seen his eyes. Yeah, well, Phoenix did. Um, it was a long time before Jean was able to, after her resurrection. Right, because um, she was sitting at the dock of the bay, just yeah. uh, That's gonna <laughs> in be the bottom. <laughs> she was in a tanning bed at the bottom of, the, of Jamaica Bay. <laughs> oh, my God, it did look like a tanning bed. Or... <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway... Um, well, I was just, I know that they just can't avoid it, but the Scott, Gene, Logan, Mishigosh, I'm just over it. That was the one thing I loved about X-Men Evolution is it didn't do any of that because most of the X-Men minus Storm, Gene, and that Storm, Beast, and um, Wolverine were teenagers. So they kept Wolf- they kept Wolverine away from the teenage girl. Take a note, Magneto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I know, <laughs> luckily Wolverine was always only best friends with them. You yeah, know, so and would occasionally spank them, but you know, they introduced a character <laughs> called Duncan, who was the high school bully at some point. Um, that Jean was dating, but then she saw him for what he was, and you know, but she always knew she had a thing for Scott. But they stayed away from all that Logan stuff, and you know, and like, and Jean Grey in X Men Evolution never did not faint from using her powers, she was badass. Yeah, she was doing all these feats without any Phoenix enhancement. You would be impressed when you see it. If mm-hmm. you see it. You go, well, I do like the aesthetic of that cartoon. So I feel like I bought the storm action figure just because I thought it was so cool from that, that line. When they but, were talking about, you know, sto- uh, as back to when you said about Rogue and going to Magneto and, you know, him being her foster mentor, whatever. <laughs> she's, she's kicked out by her dad when he realizes she's a mutant. After that infamous, she kisses Cody. And she was supposed to be somewhere between like 13 and 15 at that time. And then she says, after Mystique took me in, I, so, ha, you know, it's kind of like the Jubilee thing. I'm like, you went from 15 to 18 in what, 2.5 seconds, you know, or a month. So I don't know if they're going to retcon that because she was a teenager when Mystique took her in. And they imply that right after Mystique took her in, Mystique took her to a specialist. And well, I, why don't they just make it take place in Alabama and then they wouldn't have to worry about anyone's <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know, I'm sorry. I For... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and then, oh, it's kind of cool, though, with Jean doing that thing with the pond or the lake, you know, telekinetically lifting the water, because that's like a, 
that looks like it's a nod to when Phoenix did it in X-Men Classic on one of those backup stories. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, I know I know that happened at once. I I have to say they do have done like a, an excellent job at throwing in like some of these Easter eggs and like just little nuggets or scenes from the comic books, you know? So well, people, people were addicted to the Phoenix Saga when it came out, Phoenix and Dark Phoenix Saga, which as I've referenced previously are kind of like considered to be like the best episodes of the series. Mm -hmm. um, I'm like wondering, cause you know, they mention her and Scott on that butte. They say Nevada, but I think it was Arizona in the comics or, or New Mexico. Um, yeah. Um, and it's like, it's that scene. They're talking about that scene where she says, open your eyes. Scott, nothing right. will and that's the and first been, time. It, that would have been so awesome if he like blew her away and like just incinerated her right <laughs> She's like, that like, oops. The question of were Scott and Jean ever actually lovers? Because mm -hmm. I always assumed as they were in their 20s at that time, they had to have before then. But um, in X Factor, it's kind of established when he's telling Rusty, because uh, Rusty wanted to pursue something with Skids, uh -huh. that first time he and Jean were intimate was on that butte in wherever and uh like i said they went but if you watch the phoenix and dark phoenix saga i was like okay when did that happen because there's like really like no time she's she's it's she's got a sacrifice at the end of the phoenix saga they discover she's alive in another episode then she sent him your aisle for treatment because the phoenix is still inside her so i'm like when did they when did they take a little time out to go to nevada and Get their freak on. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I guess the suspension of disbelief has to work at some point or something. I don't know. Well, I guess it's like 30 years later. So they're hoping like not everybody has the memories that we have. But <laughs> Right. I know. <laughs> and sadly, I feel like there are people a lot worse than us. Like I, because I mean, I you're definitely like more detail oriented than I am. I'm like, as, in case it isn't completely obvious, but you know. I don't know. Like uh, some of those draw, little details can. get lost on me. <laughs> what? But I can't draw. You can. <laughs> you know, we all have our things. So <laughs> I can be your Claremont. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. So, what comic convention are you going to this weekend? It's the name needs. To, they need to rebrand the name. Um. I don't know if it was like a guitar thing or a musical thing, but it's called <laughs> Big Big Lick Comic Con. Big Lit Comic. -Con. Lick. L I C Oh, Big Lick. Oh, I thought Lit would have been better because like literature, yeah. but um, Big Lick Comic Con. What, what's, it, where is that? It's uh, near Dulles um, in Virginia. Uh -huh. uh, not from, not far from Dulles International Airport. I think it's Chantilly, Virginia. Oh, okay. um, but it's called the Dulles Expo Center. It's a, it's a smaller event con than ones you've seen me at pictures at um, in DC or elsewhere. And uh, the 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 ones that I'm I'm meeting that you would probably you know you'll know is or you'll the, is this the what Simon sends? Yes, and look what I had printed up for Walt to sign. <laughs> oh my God! Yes, he's going to be like blown away by that. It's that a is sixteen so cool. by twenty of my favorite cover of his ever. That is so cool. That really is just like a stunning piece of art. Any way you slice it, it is so gorgeous. He did such so a iconic. Job. Man, it's it's I think it's very burn inspired. You got Terry Austin Zanks. You got my favorite Titans on. I mean, when this was a fold, you know, because this is the back cover. But she got my three favorite Titans on the cover with my with two of my favorite X-Men, you know, including Donna Troy. Always got a plug on. <laughs> yeah. I have to say when the X Titans first came out, I feel like I got it um on the rack at 7 Eleven. And um I feel like I was like a fairly new like X-Men Titans fan. And um I was a little disappointed, like, because I, w I wasn't, like, I didn't know who Walt Simonson was, so I wasn't, like, super excited about it at first, but now, absolutely, of course, is like, it quickly became one of my favorite books of all time. Like, there's so many great things. Like, I could talk about that uh, crossover forever, and it's so exciting. I'm sure it's on your list. Are you getting the DC Marvel crossover Omnibuy? Probably, yes. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to get that, because... I mean, it's kind of unprecedented that they're even pressing it. So who knows when when, and if they will ever do something like that again. So I think that it's definitely something to jump on. Well, summer of 1982 was such a great year for comics. And that's when it came out. Yeah. Because I did you read Justice League back in the day? You had I to didn't. Have. I did not, believe it or not. 
All Star yeah. Squadron. I know. Like I, at- my yeah. my gateway to DC was uh, Teen Titans. My brother was a huge Marvel zombie, so it was kind of like. I felt like I was being like naughty or something like, but like when I saw George Perez's art, I was like, I unapologetically am now a DC fan mm-hmm. because I need this in my life. And then it turned into, you know, the outsiders and infinity mm-hmm. Inc. And, you know, I've always been a wonder woman fan outside of comics and before comics. So. Cause yes. Cause you're a man of style and taste. Of course. Um, but that summer when this was, when this came out, I was reading the Crisis on Earth Prime Five Parter, which was a crossover with Justice League, Justice Society, and All Star Squadron. And I just happened to be in Hawaii towards the end of the summer. My dad had a had a military trip he took out there, so he took some of the family. And Pearl Harbor is a thing in All Star Squadron because it takes place in the forties. So I was just right. kind of like got to see Pearl Harbor for real, and it was kind of cool because I was reading about Pearl Harbor in the comics, and then. Um, this was at like a newsstand I went to at some BX or base exchange um, when I was in Hawaii. And I read that thing. So the cover fell off after a while because I read it so many times. So I have multiple copies of it now of like one of some of the reprints, the original. But like I said, one of my originals is already signed by Shooter and Claremont. And I'll get Walt and Wheezy to shine the top of it, too, because Louise is an editor on the book. So her signature is oh, valid. cool. Back I love that. Jones. Yes, Louise Jones. I know. Um, but like they feel, I feel like they are just like the most lovely people on the planet. Like, and you've never met them before, have you? No, but I hear my neighbor who I run into at local con says you're gonna love them. They're so sweet. I was like, well, I'm looking forward to it because I got stuff from them to sign. I have um, Angel's first appearance is Death slash Archangel. I have Apocalypse's first appearance in X Factor. I have, you'll like this, the first New Mutants issue she does, which is the bird brain introduction <laughs> right after Claremont left. Yeah. Her first well, issue I mean, I don't want people to think that, you know, I was like this big bird brain fan or something, but I did you love know, Weezy's run on you you like know, New Mutants. Run and, you're, and you're a Blevins fan, and it's her first issue of the series. Mm-hmm. So I that it would be nice to get her to sign that. Um, so I have several things for them to sign, um, depending on, I heard you know, at some cons they don't charge, so maybe I'll get lucky and they're just doing it for free because Jim Shooter doesn't charge. No. Um, they, you know, funny you should mention Jim Shooter because uh, I was going to say the Simonsons are definitely people I would love to interview for my YouTube show. And uh, Jim Shooter is another one for sure. I was actually talking to his assistant and it never worked out. So I don't know why, but maybe it will one day. Like I watch this, I feel like uh, Jim Shooter is like, largely misunderstood you know what i mean like not to get into a bit controversial s- subject because he is quite divisive but you know it's funny i'm glad we grew up in and a comic fandom before the internet because i know that if they had the internet at that time like he would have been the biggest villain on the planet i'm sure and like from my point of view as a young reader he was the editor-in-chief of marvel so he was like the big chief behind all these books that I absolutely adored and I loved his secret wars. So I was a fan and I watched this like really interesting, like eight hour long. I mean, it's a commitment interview he did with comic book historians and it's amazing. Like all the stuff he did, you know, like just trying to keep the bills paid and the lights on at Marvel, like with the licensing and like doing all the wacky crossovers and stuff that he could do. I think he deserves a lot of credit. I mean, some of, like you said, what, 82, 85 is largely considered one of the best years in comics as well. And that's all under Jim Shooter. So, yeah. you know what I mean? And, you know, he, um, <clears throat> he when he wasn't even just an editor, he was a writer on several titles. And, you know, who doesn't love the Dazzler movie graphic novel? Um, and then uh, I, the- One of my favorites, yeah. I, like, and- it's funny because I reviewed it uh, not too long ago for my show. And I had it had been a long time since I reread it. And I gave it such a glowing review because it is amazing. It I feel like he wrote it like as if it were a movie and it really could be. It's easily, the script is just like they could film it from his comic script, I feel. And that could be a great intro for her in a live action setting if they did something along those lines. A hundred percent. Yeah, it's for sure. Her own movie before she joins the X-Men. Yeah, that would be really cool. I know uh, one of my Facebook friends, you might be common friends with him, Michael Anderson, huge, uh, huge Dazzler fan. And, you know, 
So I'm like, he would love that. You know, he's got great dazzler attire, you know? Um, and uh, it's just, I mean, I'm always like, you know, I know people love all versions and her powers are super cool, but you know me, I'm a disco dazzler kind of guy. I don't yeah. think any, anything beats her first look because it was just so iconic and interesting. And, you know, she was smarter and tougher in her disco days. She got less assured when she joined the group dynamic. And like I said, maybe that was just a choice because when you're a team of eight, you can't be as, you know, you can't be a solo artist, literally. And, you know, they just had to, you know, make choices with her character. Yeah. To I know, well, yeah, I mean, a lot happened with her character. It's funny, yeah, because Cla Claremont wrote her as like, because she's not really a pop star. Like in a way, like he wrote her as having like this sort of raspy voice and like, if I recall. And um, I love that she, like, her big debut was, like, in some, you know, seedy part of New York and some club. And, um, you know, the rumor is, of course, and I feel like it's one of those things that the internet is kind of unfortunately making happen. And if it works out well, I'll be fine with it. But I'm not, as a huge Dazzler fan, I would have never cast her. But people are so hot to have uh, Taylor Swift be... Dazzler and the rumor is because apparently she's friends with Ryan Reynolds that she's going to be in Deadpool as Dazzler so I mean if it, if it happened and it was great then I'd be behind it but the thought doesn't really excite me to be honest with you <laughs> I, 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 I can understand that yeah the artistically speaking and aesthetically I forgot to mention I was kind of bothered by the way Nightcrawler's shadows looked on his face. I know I had previously talked about the way that they shadowed Scott's face, but Nightcrawler is an interesting character because animation or live action, because you would think that these are like black, like makeup or something on his face, but it's always been shadow and it kind of just looks weird, but it also kind of look would look weird without it too. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And well, they did that with Forge too, you know? With Forge, he had very dark lines. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I just don't like you said. Is it an artistic choice? But uh, I, I was hoping you know we'd get more uh, speaking cameos from some of the, uh, the, the you know the plethora of mutants on Genosha. But you know, there's only so much time they can squeeze into the episode. Um, I like that um, Emma was psychically eavesdropping on the uh, Gene Scott Madeline drama. That was kind of cool. Um. <laughs> and I'm glad I, I'm glad I remembered because I was totally forgetting, going to forget. Did you notice the appearance of the watcher? Somebody else mentioned that. And I had, I was like, I guess I totally, it was yeah. so brief. It was, it was so, so brief. Yeah. And um, I'm just like, who, how is master mold still a thing? Cause he was like <laughs> destroyed three times in the original series. I know. comics. It, that's like the sentinel with the three heads. Like there, yeah, there was a lot going on that I was just like, I mean, it was kind of, yeah, I definitely need to rewatch because I, you know, there was like the visual feast happening and then the emotional like aspect of it all at the same time. So I was fairly, you know, just like literally on the edge of my seat, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, now there's like people are talking about um, who unleashed, who's behind Master Mold's assault on Genosha. <laughs> and, you know, theories are thrown out there. Um, my, uh, my nephew threw out, you know, oh, what, if, well, it's probably sinister. And then I made him realize and he agreed with me once I stated why I think it's not sinister is not about mechanical warfare. He's about biological, you know, mm -hmm. you know, he, he doesn't deal in, you know, robots and cybernetics or anything. <laughs> like that. Now it could be apocalypse. Um, it could be God knows, um, who was that? Was that Bastion guy? And that what was it? Uh, that that crossover to uh, um, Operation Zero Tolerance in the late nineties. Oh Christ! Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I told you that's when I started to drift off. <laughs> uh, uh, have we seen Apocalypse in the cartoon before? We did in the yeah. first series, right? Okay. He was in seasons one, and depending on what order because they aired stuff out of order three and four and five um five he takes over fabian cortez's body because um after season four he's um they change uh they try to wipe him from history 
and you think that that's going to er erase apocalypse, but somehow he's just in the astral plane looking for a body to take a body host to take over. So he takes over uh, Fabian Cortez's body. And then I think that transforms Fabian Cortez into the apocalypse we see. So he's not just in his body possessing him. He's overtaken him completely and taken on his form of apocalypse. Um, so it could be him because that was, you know, towards the end of the last six episodes, which are the worst animation of the original series. You're going to hear that a lot. <laughs> but it's also when in the series, when they changed Jean Grey from the ponytail to uh, flowing hair, as I've stated. So, like I said, season five, she was Madeline. They should they should just like, I don't know, like do something really crazy in the opening next week and just have her like. I don't know. Give her an afro or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, when um when I saw the redheaded lifeless body, I had to go back and look at the outfits to make sure <laughs> it wasn't Matt. And um I was kind of hoping. I was did you see that chemistry with her and Gambit? With Madeline and Gambit? Mm -hmm. Um I don't know if I noticed that or not. There is a little <laughs> sparkage. I mean, granted he was on the rebound. But, you know. And he's dead now, so it doesn't really matter. Oh, let's talk about that for a second. So, oh my, my God. Yeah, of course he's not dead, for real. I oh, don't he's think. dead. No, he's dead. You think but so? But he's not going to stay dead. Oh, right, right, right. There's going to be time travel, because what? why is Cable in the mix? Right, so, yeah. Because next week is Life, Death 2, where let's hope Storm gets her powers back, because boy, are they going to need her for the last three episodes. It's a three-part finale. <laughs> Um, so we know Storm and Forge are a lock for next week. The week after that, the episode title is Bright Eyes. And that to me must mean it's going to focus on Cable. And I think it's going to be like a prequel of events of what, you know, we're going to see what happened after Bishop took him as a baby into the future, how his life progressed, and then, you know, maybe show some clips of what happened in the original series when he interacted with the X-Men leading up to him showing up on Genosha to give the warning about the attack. And because um, Bright Eyes was a nickname used once by Rogue to Cable in season two. So I think oh, that's. Okay. Yeah, that has to be a, a nod to that. Um, I 100%. The, the finale to undo just, what's been done. Yeah. Just because of the fast, the breakneck speed of the storylines, I feel like 100%. And I could be wrong. I could be. I could be sitting here eating crow next week, but um, I, I feel like Storm will get her powers back just because they, they just can't do it the way they did in the comic book and have her like without powers. Like I, I thought it would be kind of like cool and a deep cut to like have it come back next um, season, but but it's life death too. So there's no way, or that's life death. So there's no way that she's not going to get her powers back. I don't And think. they're introducing the adversary, which when they did that in the comics, when they, went up against the adversary. That was her getting her powers back. Yeah, so there you go. Rest easy, Storm fans. She'll be getting them back next week, hopefully. And we can see her in the opening credits again after that happens, because it's really making me mad when I don't see her in the opening credits. <laughs> oh, wow. They, it's so funny. I love that they play with the opening credits that like that. It's so Simpsons-esque. That's That was another thing. Um, They show mostly the same stuff, but notice how they have little tidbits of like clips of characters that are going to appear in the episode. Cause I think Nightcrawler appeared in the credits. And I think there was a clip of um, Apocalypse, which leads me more to believe that he could be behind Bastion, not Bastion, because Bastion could be the Master other Mold. Master Mold's attack. Um, yeah. So I think maybe that was another little hidden, you know, gem. I agree with you. Is there anything else we need to cover here before we wrap this up? I feel like um, we've talked about most everything. But then, of course, I always think of 10 things I forgot to say when we uh, end it, too. So, <laughs> um, How did you feel about Cyclops going off on Trish Tilby, telling her, you know, basically, you know, the only reason why we do this or that, you know, because he was basically saying, you know. Well, I, I, I'm glad you brought Trish up. Like, first of all, I was not excited that they gave her long hair. I know that that's stupid, but she always had short hair in the comic book. I thought it was fun that, um, you know, um, they made, like, I forgot, but they made, like, a little reference to, to like, his, her romance with Beast. Um, so maybe that'll play out in the future. But, um, yeah, anytime uh, Cyclops wants to have, like, a, a gangster moment like that, that's fine with me. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, it was, yeah, it's, it's nice when he, you know, has a little bit of an edge. Yeah, for sure. I as know. long as you I mean, screaming, Gene, use the powers of your mind over and over and over again. And that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, and I don't think did Morph had any, any time this week. I don't. I don't. Do we'll never know. He yeah, could have been anybody. He could have been anybody. <laughs> well, wasn't that what you uh, texted him here? Like, oh my God, blah blah. blah. Oh, and hint, not a Morph cameo. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't know. He so. He would have been helpful on Genosha if he can assimilate powers when he shapes ships. Yeah, 100%. So I have to give credit to the, like, the production. Like, I have to say I'm so excited, or I'm so, like, uh, relieved that this episode was so good this week because I thought, God, were we, like, tricked into thinking this was amazing with the third first three episodes, and now they're going to completely drop the ball. So it feels like they're back on track. Like, this has to be, like, I know this is a huge hit for them. Like, clearly the buzz is alive. Like, it's all over my social media all the time. Like, this feels like the event show that people are talking about right now. Plus, it's I think it's going to finally make X-Men relevant again in live-action movies to get them to the point where the Avengers got. Because, you know, for some reason, the Fox Universe X-Men just, they were popular, but they didn't get the what do you call it, the, the, the kudos or the notoriety or whatever that, you know, that Disney got with the Avengers MCU. So I'm hoping that, you know, this is going to make X-Men, you know, super popular again, like they were in the 80s and 90s, so where people realize this really is the coolest team in the Marvel Universe. I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> it just really uh, is. You know, it, it is. because, And it's funny you should say that because while... I was happy for the Avengers, you know, um, the X-Men was always my jam. So I, I, I echo that sentiment. I hope that, you know, it returns the X-Men to popularity. I think that they know they have to, like, I feel like they must know how important it is. And I think a hundred percent, like the success of the show is definitely going to steer a lot of decisions when it comes to how the X-Men are portrayed and like what kind of course they need to be on because you know, they need to look at the fact that this show is so closely tied to the comic book and people, uh, that is what people are responding to. Um, but that said, though, I don't think that, I feel like the casual viewer could definitely enjoy the show without reading the comic book 100%. So, Well, and look how successful it is from your, from your point of view. You didn't watch the original series, you know? And you're enjoying this immensely without having seen the original series. So while it's a great continuation, it's also a good starting point for somebody to get into X-Men who wasn't necessarily before or only had familiarity maybe with the live action movies, you know? Yeah, because I mean, that cartoon was a long time ago. I mean, you know, kids who watched it then are uh, adults or, you know. But people have the same access to that as they do the current show because it's on Disney. But who wants to start with a 17, 76 episode show when they can just do 10 episodes of this? <laughs> that, I know that is intimidating as hell. It really is like I like the thought of having to go through 76 episodes. But, you know, maybe it'll be worth it in the end. I feel it will. Like I said, if you maybe pick a month to do 13 episodes, you're like, I'm going to give myself two weeks to watch these. You may watch them in two days. Sure. Or over a week. I mean, it's you get three episodes in an hour taking knocked out because they're like 21, 22 minutes. No commercial. Uh, that is, yeah, that's true. So think just, you know, don't think of it as I'm going to be watching 17, 76 episodes. Just think I'm going to watch 13 episodes this week. Maybe. Yeah, because like Game, Game of Thrones, I missed the boat on that. And I just feel like the boat like just can keep on there going. Is, there is no <laughs> boat for me on that. And I... I get a lot of, oh, give it a chance, give it a chance. Oh, no, I don't I'm know. Told, I'm told like the last <laughs> season or two are horrible. And then they're like, but the first four or five were amazing. I said, but that's like telling me to get married to somebody that I'm going to have a five-year marriage with that's so awesome and off the charts romantic and life-altering just to know I'm going to have a painful, bitter divorce that spans a two-year period. And it's going to end tragically. Why would I enter a relationship knowing that? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, good question. <laughs> I know this marriage is due. <laughs> <laughs> I know that would have to be, yeah, 
that would be a, have to be a hell of a marriage to consider that. I don't yeah. Huh. Well, I'm so excited for you to get to meet the Simonsons and uh, Wolverine's voice this weekend. Is there anyone else exciting going to be at the con? Colossus Thanks. from the like, Colossus. Colossus from the no way. He is so hot, isn't he? <laughs> Wait, is he hot? Is he the hot one? <laughs> He's not the one from X3. Oh, okay. That's the one I was thinking of. Yeah, in like the best 20 seconds of uh, X3. Oh, X2, that scene where they did in the school. But yeah, I just can't. I was jello on the floor. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I know. <laughs> they had us right there. Literally no small parts, only small actors, and that's not a small actor. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, well, what's your favorite thing about X2? I'm like, Colossus is cameo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have to think about that. <laughs> but he didn't say much. What? <laughs> uh, he didn't? Oh, I didn't know. To, you oh, know. okay. I'm sorry, <laughs> hot female mutant in his underwear. I mean, do I even have to finish? <laughs> well, I apologize for being a, a little late in this week's episode. Um, but I have to say, like, I, I also want to mention that um, a very sad news that we lost Trina Robbins yesterday. And um, I was actually very sad last night and I'm glad we didn't record because my head wasn't in the right spot. Like, Oh, and even right. now I'm getting emotional talking about it. Uh, I love Trina Robbins so much. She's such an amazing um, icon, part of comic book history. And just, um, God, I didn't know I was going to do that. Um, but I just want to say, you know, um, my heart goes out to her friends and family and the comic book industry lost a great one. And, if you have an opportunity to get, I know you're a fan, but people watching, if you ever come across Trina Robbins' work, just like, you know, get into it. <laughs> she did so many great things for women and comics and just, you know, a true legend, legend for sure. Even though it was like a short series, Legend of Wonder Woman After Crisis, people don't realize how monumental the end of that series was. Oh, no, I don't either. <laughs> well, because at the end, it's established, and I'm sorry I'm getting off X-Men topic, but um, it was, um, you know, hey, there, this is a free podcast, so we can talk about whatever yeah, we Exactly. <laughs> well, it's okay. And it's, I'll come, my, stage, my channel is about comic books, so it's all relevant. But um, at the end of that four-issue um, miniseries, you have, I think it's Aphrodite coming to Apollota, telling her that there's been a war um, uh, spanning the universes or whatever, and that Diana has been, you know, you know, wiped out, eradicated, killed, you know, however you, however you want to explain what the Anti-Monitor did to her, but you know how he devolved her, sent her back through time. And the only reason why Paradise Island had not been affected yet is because Hippolyta cast a spell. And then she she's like, but now I need to undo it and let the new universe effects take hold. So when she does that, uh, and then she makes the Amazons of Earth One constellations. But, and that's also like, they did something like that with Mechanic in All-Star Squadron, where she was holding back the effects of the crisis in World War II with her advanced technology from the future. And then when she did that, you saw like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman of Earth Two vanish. And then the Freedom Fighters take their place in a picture that the All-Star Squadron took. And then of course, in Infinity Inc., which I don't know if you read or not, um, I loved Infinity Inc., but I don't have like the recall of it that you do. <laughs> but uh, Brainwave Junior errati- uh, uh, wipes uh, Lyta Trevor's, Hippolyta Trevor's uh, memories of her parents, the original Wonder Woman and um, Steve Trevor. And then those effects affect everybody else and all them. So she can embrace her new reality. So there was like, you know, three different things after Crisis was like, well, why this has like, well, these three issues cover all of that. And then Basically, it was like a jello mold. It wasn't done setting. It's funny uh, that it, there's so much relevance to it because I always thought it was kind of just like this mini series that they needed to get out of the way before, um, like the new Wonder Woman started by Perez. Yeah, and you know, I you know my another one of my new mantras, which my friend Rodney is going to kill me if I don't say, but I can't believe Secret Wars two outsold prices. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that, it was that is crazy, but that's just that I don't know, like that just speaks to like how just 
I don't know. Marvel is just always going to outsell DC. Like it just always is for some reason. Like I, I feel like we might have even talked about this before, but like for some reason it just is like, they're just not the cool DC just isn't the cool kids the way Marvel is, <laughs> even though we love them and we yeah. don't, you know, like, I'm sorry to say that, like, please, I, I'm part of the nerd squad. I love DC so much, but I do, I don't know. It just feels like that. Doesn't it? It does. And I mean, if somebody had told me Secret Wars versus Crisis one, I would understand the first Secret Wars only because they were both 12 issue series. And even though Crisis has, you know, amazing art and very gut wrenching stories, Crisis is harder to follow than the first Secret Wars. Secret Wars one is a very nice self contained story with like 60 characters if we want to throw them all together where Crisis is 12 issues, but you have to read like 72 crossover issues <laughs> and know the history of thousands of characters that are just thrown it together. And while it's a great story and it has more long lasting effects, I have found myself rereading the first Secret Wars more when I'm like, ah, oh, what am I gonna read just for fun this weekend? And the first Secret Wars is just, it's a lot of fun. I was going to say the F word is exactly the reason why it is just so much fun. It's so user friendly. Um, anybody can pick it up. Like if you bought the toy and you wanted the comic book, like it's just a really fun story and like, you can just dive right into it. Like, cr yeah. Crisis on infinite earth was just like a freaking investment. Like you were, you had to be like kind of in it. You know what I mean? I don't think I read like every single crossover just cause you know, I wasn't like no the biggest DC fan at the time um, or, you know, had followed all of those books. So it wasn't as important to me. Um, I, that's one of the questions. And of course, I don't want to open this can of worms, but and it, it, it may be something we talked about before. But like retroactively, was Crisis worth it? Should they have never done it? Like in a way, I feel like they shouldn't have. But in a way, like I feel like they needed to. Right. Well, it was kind of, to me, it was like, it was this great uh, gymnastics routine that happened that was visually stunning and a lot of fun to watch. But I don't, <laughs> think, I don't think they stuck the landing. <laughs> you know what I, I mean? That analogy is like perfect for so many reasons. I, I agree. A lot of backflips that we were finishing with. It's like, <laughs> oh, oh, cool. And then, and then bump, crash. You know, it just, it, it didn't, it wasn't, it didn't finish right, you know? I mean, originally what they were gonna do, I think was do what they did with the new 52 and just start everything with issue one, mm -hmm. and, you know? But you know, Secret Wars had so many, even though the X-Men are kind of like, not as focused as lead characters for all, because remember they're like separated from Captain America's team. You have some good storylines with them, like Rogue coming to terms with, am I a hero or a villain? Because I don't want to die on this planet in, in, in you know, in the middle of nowhere and then she you know she finally just says you know i'm, I'm gonna stop my crying and just fight with the x-men because i made my choice and i'm tired of getting my butt kicked um and then you, yeah. know, you have storm kind of coming to grips with the fact that professor x is usurping her control of the x-men as field leader um colossus finding an adult girlfriend uh, <laughs> <laughs> and while everybody was like oh my god i can't believe Colossus cheated on Kitty. Well, he was technically under the influence of her, like, you know, hormonal healing powers or whatever. Um, but, you know, when we go back, because you brought up Shooter, I mean, I think he's the one who campaigned to break them up because when you go back and look at it, it wasn't right. He was 19 and she was 14. It's creepy. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It, it's just, yeah. <laughs> it just, it's inappropriate. <laughs> it was totally inappropriate. Oh, but she's... <laughs> her age yeah no that's not going to get you through you know a court of law <laughs> you know? I was say, tell it to the judge <laughs> exactly but you know it was um and that was a great issue when he comes back and they break up i cry when i read uncanny 183 and she goes back to the mansion and Ileana's waiting there for her saying how, how things go with my brother and she's like peachy keen and then there's like no words exchanged and lockheed's tugging at her and then she just breaks down and cries and Ileana hugs her. And then later in the issue, Storm and her have a moment, you know, where, you know, she embraces Kitty and says, you know, and this is one, this is like a really, 
it's a scary moment, but it's a defining moment for Storm where she says, I love Peter dearly, but better he had died on Beyonder's world than come back to bring my kitten in such pain. <laughs> that was so dark. I remember I'm like, that. Wow. And I was just like, I was just like <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, she didn't. <laughs> and I wasn't actually <laughs> mad at her for thinking that. But She's I, like, I've sworn to never take another life. However, I have zero value for it. <laughs> but I'm like, I'm not saying I think that she, you know, that she should have gotten her wish. <laughs> no, it's funny you should mention that. Like, I haven't thought about that in a long time. And I remember, like, that, like, really just being shook by that as a reader like yeah that was crazy <laughs> and that was the issue where you know rogue had just gotten back from her uh, experience with michael rossi where she started um uh i guess she was having what do you call it um you know when you um she was having a relapse with her carol danvers persona and you know she realized you know that she wasn't as far advanced in her therapy with professor X and she's like in the danger room, like doing all these really dangerous uh, scenarios. And she almost gets herself killed. Storm has to like, you know, lightning bolt a robot to save her life. And that leads her into two issues later uh, running off and um, storm saving her, losing her powers and back to life death. See how I brought that around. You did. <laughs> I love, uh, thank you for doing that. I know. Yeah. Cause I was going to say, so how do we feel that Gambit will be resurrected? Do you have travel, any time travel savior by cable and company or whomever? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Okay. Well, uh, let's hope. I mean, so next week we have storm and forge and then hopefully back to, <laughs> I can't even believe I'm dismissive of life death at this point. I but... know. Cause we, we, we were so stoked about that a week ago and now we're like, okay, we got to get through life death too. But once it starts, I'm just going to be like, Oh my God, it's all storm. It's all forge all the time. If she gets her powers back. I'm going to take back a lot of what I said this week about it being filler for the next episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we will definitely be eating our words next week. I know we're going to be like crying, screaming, laughing, just like the whole and nine. In your opinion, you know, you, you, you know, I think, you know, people in the industry and stuff. Um, do you think the success of this current season could end up getting the showrunner who was fired rehired? You know, um, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like I don't know the full detail. Basically, he got fired for having an OnlyFans, which I feel like that's like a like a bad reason to fire somebody. I don't know. Um, uh, I, I think it depends because it depends on if they are able to make it as good without him, I feel, because at the end of the day, money talks and they're, they need this to be successful. And I don't like, you know, hopefully they just find, um, if he's not the right fit, I'm like, how do I say it diplomatically or whatever, you know, that, that they're just able to find a, an equally talented or maybe, you know, just whoever was right under him, no pun intended, um, <laughs> who will um, be able to, um. He, I mean, he did, he already, I think he already wrote or plotted season two, so. Okay. Um, so season three would be the first one where they would have to, you know, maybe start from scratch. Right. Well, hopefully, who knows? I mean, time will tell, you know, jobs like that are fluid and change all the time. And, you know, behind the scenes, a lot of crap goes on. So, um but I mean, you know, we're enjoying it this far. So we just have to hope for the best, right? Exactly. So Life Death 2 coming our way to a Disney Plus account near you. <laughs> I, know, I know it's so funny because I watch it on my phone and I'm like, I should be watching this on my TV, of course. But like, I'm like, first thing in the morning, like I roll over in bed, grab my phone and like hit play because I, I should be watching it at midnight. I really should. Maybe that'll be next week. I don't know. If it came on midnight my time, I would totally be doing that. But I have to wait until 3 a.m. And I did that the week before just because <laughs> I'm, up super late. I'm just not doing that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably a bad idea. Midnight versus three is quite a difference. So, yeah, because nothing good just happens after three, except it's yet, unless it's the accident. <laughs> All right. Should we and should we wrap it up then? I think we're good. Uh, you know, we we know what's to come at least next week, and hopefully oh. we'll get, you know, one one piece of good news in next week's episode after all the tragedy we had to deal with this week. 
I'm sure we will. And either way, we'll be living for it. So I know, like, I feel like uh, at this point, we we should expect the unexpected because I don't know, this is definitely keeping me on pins and needles. Absolutely. Uh, another exciting episode. Cannot wait. Be back, everybody, next week for the uh, exciting part two of Life, Death, or whatever, um, Life, Death. I don't know. Is it part two? I guess it is part two in a way. Yeah, it has to be better than part one. Um, so we will be back next week to talk about our favorite show, The Exciting X-Men 97. I can't wait to see what happens and get your reaction from it. Thanks for being here once again, Philip. Thanks to everyone for watching. Um, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Hit that like button and join us back next week for another recap of X-Men 97. Thanks, guys. Excelsior! <laughs>